Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Ruby. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I want to thank my sponsor for asking me to speak. It's an honor and a privilege to be her last-minute speaker on a Saturday night. Um, <laughs> I didn't have anything to do anyways, and um, as much as I, you know, when she asked me, I was like, oh, like, what excuse can I come up with? Like, there's really no other place than I should be than a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous on a Saturday night, and it is nothing shy of a miracle and a privilege that I am asked to speak at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous by my sponsor. Um uh, housekeeping. Uh, like I said, I'm an alcoholic. I have a sobriety date. It is, um, April 3rd of 2014. So, uh, earlier this year, I celebrated five years. Um, I have a sponsor. She knows she's my sponsor. Um, cause she can't get rid of me, but like as a way to tell on myself, I have not been meeting with her and calling her as regularly as I should. And, um, Besides that, I have a home group. It's uh, Tri-Valley Friday nights in um, Pleasanton. It's young people. So I would really recommend checking it out. If you'd like to go, we could use your support. And um, my life for the past five years has been constantly surrounded by Alcoholics Anonymous and continues to stay that way. And uh, I ended up here at the age of 15 years old. Um, I... Uh, you know, it was like, I'm not, you know, I don't blame anyone for me being an alcoholic and I don't blame my parents for me being an alcoholic, but, uh, they definitely made drinking look good. You know what I mean? Sorry. I hate it when you're here. It's so awkward. (laughs) Um, so I was like born to fail. Like I, my mom is like schizophrenic and addicted to meth. My dad's like a convict and like a heroin addict. So it was like the odds of me ending up here were like pretty, uh, pretty big. And I, um, I, you know, play the tape out often and think about like who I was and how I ended up here and how, uh, my speaker at this, at the meeting, my secretary last night was talking about for his, um, for what he wanted people to share about was, uh, what makes you an alcoholic specifically. And I didn't share what I was thinking about it. And it's, um, there's something about, me and there's something about, you know, whatever people call it, allergy, genetics, whatever. Um, I have this overreaction to feelings. Like I had a really hard time identifying whatever I was feeling and I didn't like anything that I was feeling. Like even when I was happy, it was like, this isn't enough. Like I crave like euphoria. Like I need everything like to excess and to combat this, um, overreaction, to feelings and what ended up being an overreaction to alcohol and substances, I use alcohol. Um, and it's no wonder that I and everyone else here chased alcohol to the depths that we chased it because whatever you came here for, whatever you drank for, it obviously worked for like a certain amount of time. Like it worked for me and it was the only thing that really like quieted this like self-hatred and like lack of ability to handle my feelings and function throughout the normal world, how I thought I should. And I, um, and that, and that's why I drank and what I didn't know at the, um, age of 11, when I first drank that I would come to find is that every time I drank, I could do things that I could not do when I was sober and, um, it worked, it worked for a while. And I, um, I hit bottom at the age of 15 years old and moreover, the consequences became too much I can handle. And I don't need to like sit here and tell you war stories or like how I ended up here because we all know how to drink and we all know what happens. And I did all the things I said I would never did. And I became this person that I hated. And I essentially had grown up, um, with the idea that I'm never going to be like my mom and I'm never going to be like my dad. And that's exactly what I became. And I, um, I, uh, checked into rehab on this harebrained scheme to get out of, uh, drug tests with my dad thinking that we couldn't afford it. 
And uh, my counselor at the outpatient program was like, you're so fucked off. You're going to go for free. And I, um, I had gotten sent to rehab and I, I was 15 and my intake day was March 3rd of 2014. And, um, I changed my sobriety date because railing trazodone is not sober when you're in rehab. So, um, I, I got out of rehab, um, I was real young and I, um, and I didn't have any friends and I couldn't go back to the high schools that I dropped out of. And I, um, didn't necessarily know if sobriety was what I wanted. And I couldn't imagine myself living a life sober because prior to coming here and getting sober, I'd only known a life of chaos and the chaos from when I was a child was caused by other people. And then when that ended, I had to create it myself. So coming in and envisioning my life, not being like a chaotic nightmare all the time, like didn't make any sense. Um, I couldn't wrap my head around it, but when I got out, I, um, I came to this, I started coming to these meetings and I, um, I hooked up with all these girls in the rehab that I went to also wanted to be sober. And we kind of just dragged each other to young people's meetings because we didn't really know what else to do. And we'd like been on good terms with our parents. So we were trying to keep that going. And, um, I couldn't tell you why out of maybe the 60 or 90 different people that I met in that program, why now I'm the only one who stayed sober. And, um, two of them have died. One of those was my rehab boyfriend. Um, and then the last one who'd been around for four years is gone too now. And, um, I'm the only one. And, uh, I hit this point when I had a couple months sober where I hadn't gotten a sponsor. I was going to young people's meetings. I was hanging out with all these girls, but I hadn't really made relationships with other people besides that. And, um, rehab boyfriend overdosed and died. All the friends I'd gotten sober with left, uh, left AA and, um, I was alone and I had zero solution. And all I knew was how to be physically sober. Like I didn't have any emotional sobriety. And when I was at this point, like there are two options, like I can go out and do what I did before and see where that takes me. Or I can take the suggestions that people have been given me. And for whatever reason I took them and I got a sponsor and I got commitments and I reached my hand out and I started going to different meetings because when I got sober, I had the privilege of coming in here uh, with a parent and a step parent who were sober, who knew people. And I would go to these meetings. Um, and I was like 15, I'd be like sitting in diamond links in Oakland. And I'm like hearing these stories that people shared, like, Oh, like I've, I've been to prison. Like I abandoned my family. Like I killed someone. And like, I never had the privilege of having those experiences. But when those people told me that they drank and they didn't feel afraid, that was the identification that I could use to keep coming because our outward stories don't look the same. A lot of the times they don't, but the feelings are all the same. They're all there. And I am um, branched off from that world of AA to, you know, try and be a teenager and figure out how to do that without drinking or using. And I am, um, I mean, do you remember how much they were talking? I have no idea. Wait. <laughs> Tight. Um, so then I, I started doing the suggestions. I started working the steps and taking it seriously. I was working out at the big book with a woman who is more sober than I am out than I uh, was at the time, and I um I started to feel better. And I started to feel happier and I started to look at myself in the mirror and not hate myself. And I started to learn how to have relationships with other people. And we often talk about in this program about like growing up in AA, but I like legit grew up in AA. Like I graduated high school. I got a driver's license. I went to college. I got a job. And I was just talking to my dad about this last night. And it's like the person that I was five years ago. Like, I don't even know who that was. Like when I, um, talk to people, you know, who knew me when I was using and they tell me stories about who I was. And I think about the things that I did and the things that I did to other people, it makes me sick. And it makes my heart hurt because I'm not that person anymore. And it's all as a result of my work doing the 12 steps with someone else. And, um, you know, today I, um, have a life beyond like my wildest dream, something that I never thought I would have deserved. Like I was a high school dropout and I went back to college. I'm a teacher. Like people like trust me with the education of their children, uh, which is wild. I, um, I live in a house with two sober women. I have a really good relationship with my family. Like I, 
I'm constantly surrounded by like reminders of like what life looks like sober for me and I wouldn't trade that for anything and I um I can be when I you know I'm feeling upset or when shit happens because a lot of shit has happened in sobriety like I can I can be grateful that I have the life that I have because it isn't necessarily the life that I deserve and um uh welcome to the newcomers really the most important people here like four days like I like I am I know like I've been, it's uh it's really hard and you're the most important person here and um and I am really grateful to be here and um if you didn't relate to anything that I said I hope you relate to the 40 minute speaker and if not then I just suggest you go to another meeting and you keep coming back and you work the 12 steps with another person that you can really trust because that's where the good work is um I'm going to stop talking. My name's Ruby. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I'm Miles. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Miles. Forty minutes is a pretty luxurious amount of time to talk, so I'm going to pace myself here. Um, all right, so... I was born in 1979. I just turned 40 years old. Um, when I was five, my parents split up because my alcoholic father was drinking and philandering. And uh, that was the story, at least when I was five. And uh, so my father was an active alcoholic. He had all kinds of girlfriends and stuff. And one day, uh, my mother, my sister, and I were going camping for the weekend with our church. And I had this special flashlight that I had named that was like my favorite toy that I was going to take camping. I couldn't use it till we went camping. I was very excited. And I left it at the house. And we were going to leave from work, and then we had to go back to the house to get it. And I walked in uh, unexpectedly to go get my flashlight, and Dad was in the kitchen with his girlfriend. And I didn't know what that was, but I walked out to the car with my flashlight all ready to go and mentioned to my mother that he was so there was some lady in there with but dad, I don't know what that's about. Let's go. And uh, so she pulled over, jumped out, and uh, they announced they were getting a divorce that day. And uh, the next four years were uh, were him was him bottoming out. And he got sober when I was nine. And um, the reason I start with that is because I started going to AA when I was nine because of that. And so just a meeting just like this, almost exactly like this, in fact, Seeing the young lady in the kitchen, I was thinking of that because I was doing that at nine years old, going with my dad. And um, I learned a couple things there that weren't exactly the, the the best things to have learned. But the things I learned from uh, doing that was that if you drank too much, you would have to stop. <clears throat> and that was the, the loudest lesson I got from going to AA before I really understood alcohol, drinking, alcoholism, or anything. But I, I knew that all those people were there because they drank too much, and it got out of control, and so they had to stop. So that was my introduction to drinking. And then when I was around, I can't remember if it was 11 or 13, I think 13 is when I had my first drink. And I think I think my first drink was when my mother never really drank, and she had a party, a bunch of friends, and somebody brought a six-pack of uh, Samuel Adams Boston Lager, and they left, like, five of them in the fridge, which those are the kind of friends that she had. And um, they were way in the back, and they were there for a long time, and I had this dirtbag friend that we were about to start getting into a lot of trouble, but we were still just little kids at the time. And she was out one night, and we decided to drink only one. We figured if we drank one, she wouldn't notice. And we cracked one open, and it was so disgusting uh, that we started drinking it like tequila shots with salt and a lime. <laughs> and so we would trade shots on the one beer. And what, what's, so what strikes me now about that experience is that we ended up drinking three of the beers, not one. And I didn't understand this back then, but that was an early sign of alcoholism. And it's not to say that anybody who did that was an alcoholic, but uh, eventually I had many, many years of experience of very similar type of drinking, which was uh, characterized by setting a target for how much I was going to drink before I started drinking, and then I would begin drinking, and then I would drink well past the target that I had set. <clears throat> and that happened literally the first time I drank, 
Uh, for years, I've been telling the story of the first time I got drunk, and I realized tonight that the first time I got drunk was not the first time I drank. Uh, the first time I got drunk was almost exactly the same kind of thing. I had two shots each from eight different bottles of liquor at my friend's house while his parents were gone. And uh, the plan was to have one shot, and then the plan was to have one shot from each bottle, and then the plan was to have another shot from each bottle. And by the time I was done, I was just annihilated and... Um, woke up the next day uh, and started trying to get another bottle. And so I tell that story now, too, because, first of all, it's another example of me drinking alcoholically. But what I also realized eventually when I got sober was that when I woke up the next day, I was actually still drunk, and I was still drinking. I was on a bender, and the allergy to alcohol that I have was still in full effect, and I needed to get another drink. I had, I had no ability to, to, to not drink at that point. And so that, that's really important for me uh, as, as a sober alcoholic because I didn't understand what alcoholism was for many, many years. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain really literally what it is. It's the allergy of the body and the obsession of the mind. And the allergy of the body is what I just described. So when I pick up a drink, I can't control how much I drink after that. Sometimes I'll drink like a normal person. Sometimes I'll drink like everybody else at the party. But whatever it is, I'm not. I'm not able to to uh, to specify and control how much I drink once I start. And that was pretty easy for me to understand when I first got sober. My sponsor explained that to me the first day we sat down together, and then he explained the obsession of the mind, which took me about six months to really get. And uh, the way I describe it now is that. Uh, when I'm sober, I will, I will eventually fall for the idea that I can control and enjoy my drinking, which basically means I will forget that I have the allergy and I'll think that I won't have that problem when I pick up a drink. And that's exactly what my, what my life was like every day before I got sober in AA. I would wake up hungover. I would decide not to do that again. Say, I'm not going to, I'm going to take it easy tonight. I'm going to get my life back on track and then maybe maybe drink normally a week or two or a month from now, but I'm not going to drink tonight. And then later on in the day, once I started to clear my head a little bit, I would start to think, well, maybe I'll just have a couple. That sounds like a good idea. And, and back then I thought I was deciding to drink. I was choosing to drink. But now what I realize is I, I had 10 years straight of every single day waking up, deciding not to drink and then drinking and thinking that I had just changed my mind. And what it, what it, means to me now is that's the obsession. And I was trying to remember the quote that Don read in the in the uh, opening literature. There was a line there that just stuck out because I was thinking about that. Uh, it was something of, um, oh, most alcoholics will not, uh, will not agree that they have this problem or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. But that was the exact nature of that obsession is that I, I didn't think I had that problem, even though I experienced it every single day. So that was the, the nature of my drinking, uh, a little bit about how my life progressed. Um, so those drinking stories were when I was 13, 14, around there. By the time I was 15, I had uh, sort of a mix of drug problems and alcohol problems and was just really, I like dirtbag, it kind of makes it sound cute, but I was just turning into a dirtbag, but I, was, I wasn't really progressed enough to really full-fledged be one, but that was that was where I was headed. And um, I had a bad spell uh, with just a mix of things, and um, at the time I thought I OD'd, but in retrospect, it, I went way further than that many times later, but as a 15-year-old, I was really feeling like I was, I was over the edge, and um, fessed up to my parents. I, you know, sought medical treatment. I got a, a counselor. I spent a summer and weekly sessions with the family and this uh, sober AA guy who did family therapy for uh, drug and alcohol problems. And it coincided with me moving to a new city. Uh, my mom got married to a new guy and we moved about an hour away. And so I had this fresh new life and I was in AA, 15 years old. And, um, I would go to meetings and I'd get there really early. And I would I had this Dickies jumpsuit that I would keep in my, in my trunk of my car. Like eventually I was driving. And I would put that on and I would go smoke cigarettes out front of the meeting and then go to the meeting and then um, smoke after the meeting and then take it off and get in the car and go home and think I was I was like uh, hiding it. And 
So I would kind of just go hang out at meetings. And there was this one meeting I went to regularly. It was like on Tuesday or something. And I remember going to this meeting all the time and hearing the stories people would share. And they would talk about these different things. In, in retrospect, now I understand that frequently I was listening to people share resentments in a meeting about what was going, what was going wrong in their life, but uh, it was who they were angry at in their life. But at the time, I remember thinking that what they were describing was uh, the the things that made them uh, sick. It, which is funny. I, I just heard myself say that, and that's actually really true. But um, but, but what I really, I was misunderstanding alcoholism back, back then. So I thought that each person was explaining the specific reason that they became an alcoholic in their life and that it was a set of experiences and circumstances that led them to develop a, a alcohol problem. That's what I thought I was listening to. There's this one guy though that would every week, he would say the same thing if he got called on. He would say, I have this problem where when I pick up a drink, I can't control how much I drink because I'm allergic to alcohol. And I have this other problem that when I'm sober, I forget that I'm allergic to alcohol. And then I'll pick up a drink and then I'll have that allergic reaction. And I remember at the time thinking that this guy had like a really weird reason for being alcoholic. <laughs> because it wasn't about his childhood or his mother or his spouse or his job. It wasn't about all these things. It was just like this really weird physical thing that I had never heard of. And years later, I realized that he was the only guy really in the room saying what alcoholism really was, or at least the only guy that I heard at that time. Um, so he, he became my sponsor, but I didn't know what a sponsor was. And, and um, I, don't, I honestly don't remember him telling me either. Uh, but um, I thought step work was uh, like an advanced thing. Like I thought there was kind of – so I grew up in an Episcopalian church and. Uh, by that point in my life, I wasn't really interested. I didn't identify with that at all. But I remember there were like there was like the priests and the people on the the whatever the stage, uh, and then there were like the the people that like the ushers. But the, these are not the right names. But so those middle people, I thought those were like the people that do steps in AA, where they're kind of like a little bit advanced, but they're not like running the place yet. And uh, that everybody else was just in the congregation. That's kind of what I thought AA was about. And so eventually I went to college, I moved away, and I remember my dad telling me, so, oh, I, yeah, so he got sober when I was nine, so nine years later I went to college, and I remember him saying when I went away, went away to school, he said, you know, you have um, an opportunity to uh, reinvent who you are to the world, because people don't know you, and you, you have a choice to make about what kind of person you're going to present to these people. And looking back on it, I realized what he was saying. I think there was more to the talk, but um, I realized what he was saying is if you go to this new city, Santa Cruz, and you cement your relationship in AA as a, as a sober young man, that will be who you are. But if you go and you don't present that and you try to be somebody else, you will probably go that direction. And that's what I did. And I, I did say, oh, I'm, I'm sober, but I, I wore it like a, like a coat of lead. Like, I'm sober, and I would go to parties with all these new friends, and they were all drinking and smoking pot, and I would just be like, no, no, I don't, I can't, you know, and it was like, I martyred myself with it. <laughs> and I didn't, again, I still didn't understand what it was or anything, I just, I just knew that I couldn't drink, and I didn't really understand why, and I just was sort of bitter about it, and uh, I had not done any step work or anything, and it took about a month before I picked up. And so... Uh, I got so, I got sober for real when I was 29, so it was 11 years later. And in that time, uh, I had uh, the type of drinking that I was describing. Um, I had various states of drug addiction included with that, and I would ping pong between them. Sometimes combine them. Um, a lot of times, I would get clean and continue to be a daily drinker. And then I did that for about two years straight with no drugs, and I gained like 30 pounds, and I was just red all the time and just getting really ill. And then I went to just only heroin, and I stopped drinking for two years, and I immediately lost a bunch of weight. And I was, I was actually, like, for the first few months, I was actually more awake and, and more, like, happier, and I felt, I felt like I got it right for the first time. And um, cause that, So that was actually the problem. Before that... Every single day was, was an attempt for me to get the right mix, for me to get the, the right amount. And the, the way that the allergy reacts, tell me if you relate to this, uh, 
I would be uncomfortable, sober, and I'd be like, nah, you know, I need a drink. And it was usually kind of a very casual idea. I need a drink. Do you want to get a drink? Let's get a drink. It sounds great, right? And in my mind, I would usually think that, you know, one, I always knew one drink was not going to be enough. Like, that always made me feel worse. But I was always like, two would be good, but I would always kind of feel like three was like the right amount. Like, if I could get three drinks, I'm going to be good. And that was my target frequently. And the problem is, once I had the first drink, it was still about three drinks that I needed beyond that. By the time I had the second drink, it was like, I'm not really sure. By the time I had the third drink, there was not a number that would satisfy me. And I just was going to drink more. And, and so, the, like, the, the, the point at which I would feel satisfied was always just outside of the reach for me. And the, the part about the allergy, okay, this, so, uh, I like to describe the allergy like this. Uh, for normal eaters, okay, if, you, if someone has an eating disorder, this might not apply. But for, for people that eat normally, uh, if you're hungry um, and you eat, well, okay, when I'm hungry and I eat, I'm less hungry and I'm more full, and I don't want to eat more food. The more food I eat, the less food I want to eat thereafter. And um, when I drink alcohol, the opposite happens. The more I drink alcohol, the more I want the next drink. And that's what I thought drinking was like for everybody. <laughs> and it took me years in sobriety to realize that normal people actually just have a completely different feeling when they drink. And I don't fully understand the feeling, but whatever it is, it's the, it's the feeling that enables people to say, I've had enough. And that's not something that I had never, I, all I knew was I really should stop, not I've had enough. And sometimes I would stop and sometimes I wouldn't because I couldn't really control. Anyway, so uh, for a brief period there, I felt like I got that mix right when it came to drugs. But, the, you know, I bottomed out and I got sober in, when I was 29. And I was, um, I was in a relationship. I was married to my, my running partner. You know, we, we met on an alcoholic bender for months <laughs> and went through all of that stuff in my 20s, like uh, ping-ponging between different ways of living, different cities. I moved to and from the Bay Area, I think a total of seven times, back to, to Riverside, and um, ended up here a, few, a year or two before I got sober. And um, when I got sober, so this is why I got sober. This is sort of, a, I can't tell if it's an analogy, metaphor, symbolism, but it, this is why I got sober. So um, here's like good life. So for the recording, I'm holding my hand up high. Okay. And then here's like death and it's lower. Okay. And these are like horizontal parallel lines. And so when I, when I first started drinking, Drinking would make me go higher up, and life would get better. And it just took a little bit of effort to get that bump. And then over the years, my steady state would get lower and lower, closer to just death or obli ob oblivion. Not oblivion, but like uh, just pfft, it's over. And it would take more and more effort to get that little bump up to feel better. And so the point, at, so I thought sobriety was way like right above death. And that <laughs> sobriety was like the last thing that I would do as like a last ditch before I died. And I also thought I was going to die young. So it was like, which one's going to happen first? I'm not sure. Um, that's a funny thing too. So when, once I turned 28, I realized that it wasn't sexy anymore because I wasn't going to die at 27 like all the cool people. And uh, I was like, oh shit, I'm just, uh, now I'm really a dirt bag. I'm not, it's not going to be glamorous when I die. So I'm, the day that I got sober, well, actually the day I got to AA, which was several months before I got sober, the day I, the day I went to AA for the first time in about 10 or 12 years, um, the way that I felt was uh, worse than what I thought I was going to feel like if I went to AA and got sober. <laughs> And the idea, I, for, I forgot this, the other idea that I picked up from those Saturday meetings when I was nine years old, um, and looking back on it, this is certainly not what I was actually witnessing, but this was the idea that I took away, was that AA was going to teach me how to endure the pain and discomfort of sobriety, and that I was going to come here kind of like a, like a personal trainer, it's like fight through the pain, push, 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 and that's what I thought the, the congregation or the fellowship of AA was about. And so... Uh, 
that's that's a, that idea is what kept me out of here for so long because I, I thought that was going to be an awful way to live the rest of my <laughs> life, and so I was going to try every other thing possible. So the day I got to AA, that sounded better than what I imagined was going to be the rest of my life if I didn't go to AA. That's how I felt, and um, I had I had developed this image, you know, of. Uh, I think it had Michael Keaton in it from the movies from the 80s, but it was this image of old men in trench coats and baggy suits and cigars and cigarettes and had rusty, rusty voices and like, hey, kid, get in here, sit down and drinking uh, Folgers. And that's what I thought, you know, when I because I so I had been to meetings, you know, in what was like the early 90s and they, they smoked on this side of the room and not on that side of the room. And I and I just had this awful notion of AA. And the, the first meeting that was available the day I decided to go uh, was at the dry dock in San Francisco. I was living in Twin Peaks at the time. And it took like an hour and a half by bus to get there. And um, I walked in, and it was like 25 punk rockers. And that, that was the best possible thing that could have happened to me because it immediately just spun me around and disoriented me completely about all of the ideas I had walking into that room about what was about to happen and what AA was about. And um, I found myself, so I, I walked in and then walked out and <laughs> went and smoked a cigarette because I had a couple minutes and there was just this guy out there and like all pink with chains and like platform creepers. And he was kind of like non, like, not really. It was just me and him, and I was just like ten feet away, and I was kind of like half looking at him, like, is he, "Do I say hi to this guy? What is this?" And then he just kind of like flippantly was like, "Hey, man, what's your name?" And just introduced himself, and and then he was a secretary, and so we went in and sat down, and the speaker said this thing that just cemented, not cemented, but started my relationship with AA. He said uh, he was telling his story, and he said that his moment of clarity was when he was partying so much that he had gotten kicked out of his parents' house. He didn't have a job. None of his friends would let him stay there, but he would still party with them all the time. And then he would leave and then go sleep on the streets or in a park or something. And he said this one morning he woke up and he had a, a little bud in his pocket, and that was it. And he was digging in a trash can to find a, a soda can to smoke it with. And this family walked by, and this little kid pointed at him and said, Look, Mommy, a homeless man. <laughs> And he said he realized, like, he had, like, this third eye view of himself and realized who he had become. And I had just had an experience like that a couple months before. And um, the experience was that I was in the Tenderloin at 6.30 a.m. And there was a prostitute walking by me uh, just dancing and snapping her fingers. And I wanted to. I, I wanted her life, and it was better than my life. And I had this vision, like, wow, that's, that's where I'm at now. So he said that in this meeting, and I was just like, this is it. Like, I get it. This is, th that's how I am. And I, and I felt connected to, to AA. Like, I felt like I was in the right place. And so that was three months before I got sober. So I went to meetings um, pretty much every day, and I wouldn't stay sober a single day, but I just kept going. And then nothing spectacular really happened. It's just that one day somebody came up to me, as many people had, and um, introduced himself to me. And he took me to another meeting, which I had also I had only been going to that spot. And they had meetings all day, and I would just go to that spot and be like, I'm going to stay in meetings all day until I'm sober for the rest of my life. And I would never make it. And he took me to a different spot for a different meeting, and I met these different people. And just breaking that mold a little bit that I had gotten into for three months, kind of like, oh, this is a little more fun. And um, I I hung out with those guys that night, and we went to a taqueria, and they bought me food. And I was so broke that that was like, I was like, oh, my God, this is so wonderful. These people are so kind. And they invited me to a meeting the next day, and I went to a meeting. And then um, I had some, uh, like, detoxing to do. You know, I was messed up, and I, I was physically really ill for months. And they invited me to their house every morning to come over, and they would let me spend the night there if I wanted to. I was still married to my ex-wife then, so I, would, I didn't do that. But I would I would get up and, like, go out for the day and go and, like, nap at their house, and it was so kind, and they would take me to a meeting. And uh, a few months later, I was just, like, on fire in AA, and I realized eventually that both of those guys were, like, on drugs that whole time. But they were trying to get sober. And they were taking me to meetings and, and, like, introducing me to people. And it was really bizarre that that worked. 
Um, but that, so the guy that introduced, introduced me to those guys introduced me to my sponsor. And I met with this guy uh, every Saturday at 11 o'clock for an hour. And we met at uh, Muddy Waters on 16th and Valencia. And we would go to High Noon at 12.15 on 15th and Valencia every Saturday. And he, he said something the first time we sat down. So he explained the allergy and the obsession. And he also said that we were going to do the steps, which was, that was like, when, okay, now I have heard about the steps for the first time. And um, he said that the first 11 steps were intended for me to, to have a spiritual awakening and to learn how to get sober and how to stay sober. And then the 12th step was where I was going to, from then on, show that to other people. And that in doing that, I was going to go through the steps perpetually for the, as long as I stayed sober and as long as I did the step work. And he said that to me in our first meeting. And I say that to guys now every time I meet with them. And, and the, the effect that had on me, this is really funny. So uh, when, he, when he said that to me, I was an arrogant, you know, prideful, uh, you know, whatever, add a word there. And, um, and when he said that to me, I was like, so I'm going to be in charge after I do these steps. I just have to do these steps, and then I'm going to be able to tell everybody else what they need to do, which is like what I was thinking about every day for my entire life anyway of what everybody else should do and why won't they listen to me. And so it appealed really well to that, to that natural uh, idea that I carried anyway. What I didn't know then and what I learned is that going through those first 11 steps introduced me to the concept of living uh, humbly by spiritual principles and that I would actually be a transformed person by the time I got to the 12th step, but I, I didn't realize that. And so the idea, that idea ended up, um, uh, ended up changing. So um, I paused because by my watch I have 15 minutes, but you gave me the 10 minute warning. So <laughs> I'll go by your yours instead. Okay, let me reset it. Um, okay, so I worked the steps with that guy for a year, and then he he drank right around when I celebrated a year, and he drank like two weeks after I got my first sponsee, and I was that that arrogance that I described he. We would talk about that a lot, and I, I wanted to start sponsoring it about three months, and he he said, no, he said I couldn't. And um, looking back on it, yeah, I don't know if I agree with the way he did that, but, but looking back on it, what I understand now is that he was responding to my, my pride, and that I wanted to sponsor out of pride and arrogance, and that I had not yet gotten to a place of humility where that was the, the uh, underlying principle of that work. But uh, eventually, a guy just asked me, like, really point blank, like, please, will you sponsor me? I want you to be my sponsor, rather than me going out trying to get sponsees. And I told my sponsor that, and he said, all right, you know, it's time for you to sponsor someone. So, yeah, go for it. And two weeks later, my, sp my sponsor drank, which is really weird. That was really weird. Um, and the weirdest part was that he... he he was still available, like, he made himself available still to sponsor me. Like, it was this weird thing where the decision was for me to make whether or not he would still sponsor me. And it was really confusing for a week or so. And um, I, did, I did not continue working with him, which I'm really glad for. Uh, at the time, I just didn't understand that that's really obvious. Don't, don't work with my sponsor when he just drank. So uh, I got a new sponsor, and... I don't want to get stuck in this long story of sponsors, but the, the the best way to describe it is that I spent maybe, well, nine years total uh, struggling with finding a sponsor that I really felt good about working with. And in that time, I was with one guy for about five years. But in the beginning, I was with a few, and then five years with one, and then a few years with a few different people. And um, I just kept doing the work that they were taking me through and I kept doing step work and it was, it looked a little different with each guy and they each had a little bit of a different style of doing it. And, um, towards the end there, I was kind of going through a few folks and it, 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 I think I'll, I'll just be confident in saying this. 
towards the end there, it really wasn't me. It was the guys I was with. It was just a really bad, really bad relationship and uh, with a few different people. And I tried to, to, to get to a place where it was working, but it just wasn't. And what ended up happening is, well, first of all, I want to say through that whole time, I was sponsoring other guys. And I had a, a few folks that I still sponsor to this day that I've been working with for like five, six years. And it, they were they were a constant force there through that, which was really helpful. Um, but it was confusing for me as as far as who my sponsor was. So my wife is here in the second row, Annie, and uh, we had a daughter two and a half years ago, and a year and a half ago we moved to Oakland from San Francisco. And I had a sponsor then that I just started working with that I really liked, but it was just not. He was in San Francisco and just wasn't working. And I met this guy Joe, who actually spoke here last year when I was the speaker picker here. And uh, it's just it's just been beautiful ever since then. And it's just it's gotten really simple. It's gotten really clear. Uh, it's just I don't know. I don't I don't want to wax on. To it. It's it's more meaningful for me the words I'm going to say about it. But it's just been really great. And so um, let me talk a little bit about moving to Oakland. So before I moved here, I had what I would describe as a just a really solid program. I had um, regular meetings. I knew a lot of people in the room when I went there. I had a lot of history with people. Um, I had uh, the opportunity to work with different guys quite a bit. And anytime somebody moved or something happened and I, and I wanted to sponsor someone new, I, it was easy to find somebody that was interested and, and wanted to. And I was available. And um, it's just my my life was built around all that. And then when I moved to Oakland, we had this baby. I had a longer commute. I didn't have regular meetings. The meetings are slightly different here. And uh, I just, to me, the meetings in Oakland are a little more passive than they are in San Francisco, which is more mellow. Uh, but it was difficult for me. So I would come into meetings and feel real sleepy and feel really like, uh, I don't feel like it's really hitting me the way that I want it to. And... I think the number one thing that's been the most challenging is um, that my relationship to meetings has shifted a little bit to what I can get from them and a little bit away from what I have to offer and what I can contribute. And um, that was that was one of the biggest shifts uh, after getting acclimated here is just making sure I show up a little bit early and I make an effort to meet people and, and talk to them a little bit, and that made a huge difference. Um, it, it just dawned on me that I haven't once made any reference to uh, God or, or a spiritual way of living, uh, living by spiritual principles. And um, I want to think carefully in my last couple minutes of how to talk about that. So what, what has become obvious to me now is that... Uh, the entire function of AA and the steps of AA is to enable me to have a spiritual awakening that will help me to stay sober. And that in order to maintain that, I need to be in a position of actively sharing that with other people in an effort to help them have the same experience. And that's probably the, the, the simplest way I can describe it. Um, and, and that is the most fundamental element of my entire life at this point. So my, uh, my job is something that services my ability to have that experience. My relationship with my wife is, is built on that, and, and we interact based on that experience and fostering that experience in ourselves and for each other. My relationship to AA is, is based in that, that this is, not a, uh, this is not a discipline that I have to adhere to. This is not a... Uh, social group. This is not uh, whatever. There's all kinds of things. It's not what it is. It's a spiritual body that I participate in, in pursuit of, of a continued spiritual experience that is fostered by service. And in sharing that with people one-on-one, -on -one, sharing it here as a speaker, sharing that as a, uh, having a commitment at a meeting, um, and then working with AA as an organization to help create space for people to have that experience in meetings, in different regions, in incarceration environments, all that kind of thing. And um, when I when I can remember that, everything in my life is so much easier. 
And when I start to think that AA is something that I have to find space for because I need it, then everything is too big and everything is too hard. And I think, um, you know, in the in the last few years of my sobriety, that has been one of the, the biggest challenges is remembering that orientation to to my sobriety. Because it's really easy when things are moving fast and there's a lot to do and things aren't done when I want them to and I've got stuff still to do and I've got to go. And it's really easy to forget that all of that stuff is made possible by this experience. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.